I took this picture last year at the MIT Museum. It's a mind-blowing machine built by the one and only Claude Shannon. And this machine uses electric and mechanical switches to solve for the final moves of chess. And I find the naming really fitting. It's called the Endgame Machine. Because at that time, the world's top computer scientists all thought that solving chess would be the end game to AI. And then in the next 70 years, Claude Shannon got way more than his wildest dreams. In fact, we beat chess 40 years ago. We solved poker and Go and Dota 10 years ago. And this year, we won a gold medal uh, at IMO and also a Nobel Prize for protein folding. We have made our parents proud. Our AI is on track to master anything that can be reduced to a sequence of strings. So what's left to do? What more glory to capture? Well, here's something that my parents are not proud of. <laughs> you host a hackathon party on a Sunday, and then you wreck the house. You leave for work on Monday morning, and you come home to a clean house and a candlelit dinner. And yet you couldn't tell if a human or robot had been there. And that's what I'm calling the physical Turing test. Right? It's so mundane, so deceptively simple. All it does is it involves tasks that you take for granted in a messy, unpredictable physical world. Yet I would argue that this is the next, or perhaps the last grand challenge of AI. So how are our most advanced humanoid robot butlers doing so far? Well, trying again, right? It's machine learning. It has to learn. Oh, no. Catastrophic forgetting. How about cooking? Where's my candlelit dinner? This clip gives me a lot of anxiety, you know? People worry that the robots will rise up against us someday. And I will say, no, thanks. I think we're fine for a while. And it's not done yet. It's not done yet. Can it clean up? Ah. Oh, brutal. Or well, I, I give it, at least it went out like a chimp, right? But it went out like a chimp. I haven't not seen a sexier post than that. <laughs> so why is it hard? Why is robotics so hard? A certain great man said that LOMs are running out of data. Ilya is calling the internet the fossil fuel of AI. What I want to say is, you LOM researchers are so spoiled. You have no idea the pain and suffering that we roboticists go through because we don't even have that data. This is a typical episode that we collect for a robotics training session at the NVIDIA headquarters cafe. And this is what the data looks like if you plot it. It's high-dimensional, continuous robot joint control data. And you can't scrape this from the internet. You can't download it from Wikipedia. And that makes it hard. So how to solve robotics? Basically, it boils down to two things, the data strategy and the model strategy. And let's zoom in on the data first. We collect data by quite a brute force way that we call teleoperation. Basically, a human operator will wear a VR device, and that streams her hand pose in real time to the robot. So you can control the robot in this way to do the task that you want them to do. And here on the right-hand side, it is looking through the egocentric camera of the robot. So as if you're kind of stepping into an avatar and then make the robot fingers move like your own. And as you can see, this is very tedious. And you hit the physical limit of no more than 24 hours per robot per day. And actually, who am I kidding? It's more like four hours per robot per day. And when the robot god is merciful, when they don't throw tantrums, when you babysit them correctly, you get four hours. It's not scalable. And if we put it on this data pyramid view, it's really on the top of the pyramid. The real data is high quality, but it has the physical limit. So that's really the human fuel. And then at the bottom, we still have the fossil fuel, because all of these data can pre-train reasoning models and VOM models. Now what I'm most excited about is what's lying in the middle. And those are the synthetic data that I'm calling the nuclear fuel, the next generation of what would power the robotics revolution. So the nuclear fuel is infinite in principle, but it's limited by PhD brain cycles, 
because we actually need to come up with novel ways to generate these data, and then GPUs, because you are trading compute for data. And the more you buy, the more you save. <laughs> this message has been approved by my boss. <laughs> so how to build a nuclear reactor for robotics? This is Eureka, a technique that allows us to train high degree of freedom hands to do tasks like pen spinning. And I want to admit, I'm a subpar human. I can never really do pen spinning. I gave it up since my childhood. I'm very glad to see my AI avenge my poor skills. So how do you get the data to train these complex skills? The answer is there is no supervised data set at all. It's all done by reinforcement learning in massively parallel simulations on the GPU. Because very luckily, all the physics equations are basically matrix multiplications. And then running on CUDA, you can run simulations like Isaac Lab to accelerate reality to be 10,000 times faster than real time. Now the question is, how do you transfer this to real? We use a technique called domain randomization, where for the 10,000 environments, you vary their gravity, friction, and weight parameters slightly, and then you follow the simulation principle. Suppose you have an AI model that's able to master one million realities with different physical parameters. Then with high likelihood, it's going to zero shot the one million and first, which happens to our own physical world. And that's the simulation principle. And then we can apply that to all kinds of robots. We build digital twins of the robot dogs, transfer to real. We are able to manipulate blocks using high degree of freedom hands. And this one is the most interesting. Actually, in Isaac Lab, doing yoga ball simulation is hard. It's bouncy, it's soft. So we didn't even simulate that. But we're able to transfer that to the real world. We're roboticists, we're weird, so we just run it in the streets. <laughs> you know, sometimes I feel like I'm a director of a Black Mirror episode. <laughs> and after seeing this demo, one of my friends told me that he tried a yoga ball on his own dog, and he couldn't do it. So I'm very proud we have achieved super dog performance. <laughs> and then you can scale this up to way more complex hardware like the humanoid. We instantiate an army of humanoids in Sim, and all of them are going through 10 years worth of training in only two hours of war clock simulation time. And with that much data, we can train a 3 million parameter neural net. Note it's not billion, it's 3 million parameter to control the robot body to stay balanced, walk, run, and jump, and dance. And this small neural network captures the subconscious motor coordination that we humans do all the time. And it's running at a millisecond scale on just an orange GPU on board. So when you visit NVIDIA office, this is shot in the Voyager building, part of NVIDIA headquarters. When you visit us, you might run into these guys running around in the building. Don't be a stranger, say hi to them. And also, don't forget to visit our robot hospital. <laughs> These robots work as hard as our PhDs. No robot harmed during filming. So if we plot simulation data on these two axes, where the x-axis is the diversity and the y-axis is the speed at which we can produce data, what you just saw is what I call simulation 1.0, the digital twin paradigm where you build a one-to-one -one replica of the robot and the world. But that also requires artists and engineers to make and create those replicas by hand. Can we do better than that? Of course we can. We have text to 3D models to generate simulation assets. We have diffusion models to change the textures of the environment on the fly. And you can compose and then generate lots of different layouts. And we can put those together in a hybrid simulation engine that we open source called RoboCasa. And it is an engine that leverages LOMs, diffusion models, text to 3D to procedurally generate infinite variations of indoor environments that you can train a robot in. So now go back to Teleop. But instead of controlling the robot to collect data in the real world, we collect one human data in simulation, and we can instantiate it in infinite variety of procedurally generated kitchens. So it can have a lot of visual variety. And we can also augment the motions, the actions 
through a process called Groot Mimic. You start with one human demonstration. You multiply that to n trajectories using environment generation. And then you do n times n motion generation. And I promise this is the only math you're going to do today. So here on column one and three are the real data we collect at the lab. And column two and four are generated through this generative physics engine. So you can see that they still look toyish. You can tell the difference. But they sort of capture the vibe of the real world. right? It's kind of a distribution, a similar distribution, but not exactly digital twin. So we call them appropriately digital cousins. Now how about this? How about this thing? It's got soft body, right? fluid, translucent glass, and these very complicated food parts that's almost impossible to describe. How long would it take an artist to create this scene in simulation? It's going to take forever. And if we look at the gaming community, it took them 30 years to go from the left to a photorealistic racing game on the right. Yet it only took the video generation community two years to go from something on the left to something on the right. It's still hilarious in 2025, but at least now it's physically accurate noodles. That's important when you get the physics correct. And actually, if you recall, I showed this episode at the beginning. I tricked you. There is not a real pixel in this devil. It's all dreamed up by a video world model, by a synthetic data scaling method that we call Groot Dreams. How it works is you take a pre-trained video foundation model on the left, and you can fine tune it on the data that we collect on the robot at the lab. So Groot Dreams now understands the mechanical constraints and the behavior of the robot. And then you can use it as a neural simulator. So here, the left and the right side start from the exact same initial frame. The only difference is the language. And then we can roll this out. On the left, you pick up the apple and place on the pan. And on the right, you pick up the can and place on the pan. And the video model simulates these counterfactual futures. And because it's a video model, it doesn't care how complex the scene is. So you can have a lot more objects, and it's the constant time compute runtime. And you can pick up the cucumber, pick up the spray bottle. It can all roll out. And then all these lighting and reflection and object mechanics, you don't need a ray tracer. It's all learned through data. And by scaling up the pipeline of good dreams, we're able to generate millions of what we call neural trajectories to help train the model. And here's something fresh out of the oven. We can push this even further. How about we teleoperate the robot inside a video world model? So these videos you see here are generated interactively and in real time, as if the robots and their hands are moving through a lucid dream. So that's a sneak peek to the next generation of Google Dreams based on the NVIDIA Cosmos video foundation models. So I like to think of video world models as Dr. Strange. They have seen almost every possible physical phenomenon from billions of internet videos. So the model learns a superposition of visual realities. And when you prompt it, it collapses the infinite possibilities into one chosen future. And that is simulation 2.0. The neural physics engines, it's soft, it's learned and programmed by internet videos and data instead of graphics engineers by hand. I call them digital nomad as they wander through the latent space of a diffusion model. So now you have these techniques. Which one do you choose? What's your favorite data? Well, we're roboticists, we're data poor. So unlike Ilya, we can't be picky about our data. We need to integrate all the data under this curve. And we develop a very simple recipe to use this synthetic data integral. Because they all generate into the same data format, you can co-train by sampling from the real SIM 1.x and SIM 2.x pipelines through some weighting functions. And that's it. Incredibly simple recipe. And of course, we show that adding these synthetic data gives you a lot better performance than using real data alone. So know that I'm more than two thirds through my talk, but I didn't even discuss the model yet. Where's the model? If you take away just four words 
from my talk today. It's data maximalist and model minimalist. So we build very complex data pipelines, but the model is a clean artifact that compresses the trillions of tokens generated by the data pipeline. And this is what our model looks like. It takes directly from photons to actions. And inspired, inspired by the work, Thinking Fast and Slow, the System 2 component is a VOM that does slow, deliberate reasoning and understands language instructions. And the System 1 component is fast and reactive. And we use a diffusion model because the diffusion models are actually really great to generate continuous values like actions. So we basically render these actions at more than 100 hertz. And putting this together, that's the Groot N1 vision language action or VOA foundation models that we built. And this is 2 billion parameters. And we can add different dimensional heads on top of the DIT to adapt to a wide variety of robots. So here is a quick demo of the Groot uh, N1. Actually, this is N1.5 model in action. So the task is to fetch the healthiest snack. And the robot sees through its egocentric view. It reasons, goes through a reasoning loop, reasons that Apple is the best for you, and then it picks it up. And here's another work fresh out of the oven. We discovered an RL post-training recipe to make VOA models super robust. Here, what you see is actually a robot assembling GPUs continuously for hours on end without failure. It's actually almost therapeutic to see these robots tirelessly assemble GPUs. And this task has been approved by my boss. Good boy. Good boy. And we train Groot on Ray, and we open source the model weights and the fine tuning recipes to democratize physical AI. And Groot loves Ray. Why? Because as of now, almost all of our compute jobs are based on Ray. The most important reason is versatility. We need to perform a wide variety of compute tasks, all the way from physical AI, multimodal physical AI sensor data processing, to large scale VOA training, and to evaluation. And our evaluation pipelines are very complex because we use thousands of different simulation engines and environments running in parallel. So basing on Ray as a single engine for these tasks has made our life so easy, greatly simplified our infrastructure, and I, I believe Ray has accelerated our progress towards solving general physical AI. Now what's next? As physical AI matures, I believe the world will soon see the emergence of physical API. You know, throughout most of human history, it's these pairs of human hands, manual labor, that rearranges and reshapes lumps of matters into civilization. Now, physical API will, for the first time, offer us a programmatic interface to rearrange the world of atoms. And once we have the physical API, all of the good things, the, the familiar concepts that people use for LLMs and AI agents will transfer over to robotics. Like we'll have novel physical prompting methods, embodied MCP, and agentic fleet that coordinates a lot of robots to deliver a task. And on top of these, I'm very excited by the concept of programmable factories, where any new product you need you can program it almost overnight and scale up production. And self-driving wet labs to automate scientific discoveries. And on top of all of that, the physical skill economy. The ultimate app store where anyone can access and enjoy the sum of all human dexterity. So someday in the near future, you come home from work. And instead of folding laundry, or scrubbing dishes, you sit down to a candlelit dinner with your partner, your kids, your parents. And the robots will just fade away into background ambience. And everything is so mundane that you wouldn't even notice. And the day that we solve the physical Turing test will simply be known as a Tuesday. And join us on the journey to the moon.